We have a situation brewing with the carbon dioxide. We had a CO2 filter problem on the lunar module. Five filters on the limb, which are meant for two guys for a day and a half. So I told the doctor. They're already up to eight on the gauges. Anything over 15, and you get impaired judgment, blackouts, the beginnings of brain asphyxia. What about the scrubbers on the command module? They take square cartridges. The ones on the limb are round. <laughs> Tell me this isn't a government operation. This just isn't a contingency we've remotely looked at. Those CO2 levels are going to be getting toxic. Well, I suggest you gentlemen invent a way to put a square peg in a round hole. Hey, everybody. We had received a good question about copyright, and we thought this would be a good chance to uh, take our answer regarding that and share it with everyone else. There's certainly a lot of questions about copyright and uh, what's permissible and not in the era of remote learning, and this question went right along with it. In this case, we have a teacher who is a Project Lead the Way teacher uh, doing a lot with engineering in the curriculum and uses clips of the uh, popular movie Apollo 13 to go and show engineering principles at work. Has done so in the face-to-face -face class and now wanting to do so in the online class that they offer. Is this permissible? Is it uh, a copyright violation? So what what is uh, what's the answer to that? And that kind of brings about this crash course in copyright. Copyright is very complex, and so really the answer to that is there is no cut and dry answer, or probably even a better answer is it's legal if a judge says it's legal. What's permissible with copyright? Whatever the judge will say is permissible by copyright. Now, that seems like it's squelching out of the uh, uh, the answer, but that's kind of the reality. There, there is a lot of different interpretation about what it, uh, what it means. Before we talk a little bit about that and help give a little bit more guidance for that, because that certainly isn't enough to move forward as a teacher and do things with, Let's just kind of set the basics. Copyright is a good policy. Uh, it is something that protects uh, American people as well as people worldwide. Basically what it says is you cannot go and make a copy of something that someone else owns the rights to. So uh, making a copy can be a lot of different things. It could be the retransmission, it could be you know, re-scribing, re it could be taking it and adding things to it and such. It isn't just simply reading it aloud or you know these type of things, checking it out from the library. That's not making a copy. There's still one copy and the, uh, the library that has uh, purchased it has the right to go and allow other people to look at that particular copy. Now, copying isn't always making a physical copy of something else like with a photocopy machine. Sometimes copying can include uh, rebroadcasting it to larger audiences. When you buy a movie, you have limitations on who and how many people can go see that movie. And in most cases, for home use, that's, that's not a problem at all. But you don't necessarily have the right to go and uh, rent out your own movie theater, have people come over and then broadcast it on the big screen there. That's not allowed. Otherwise, movie uh, houses would have do that and save a lot of money on that process. So uh, rebroadcasting is one other issue. And in the digital world, uh, making a digital copy is another issue that has to be uh, watched out for. If there were not these copyright protections, uh, a couple things would happen. First off, people would uh, take and use their own things. Some of them would monetize it, make money off of what they did uh, and deny the original creator that money. And the process of creating these things to begin with is not free. It's not you know something that's just easy to do in a lot of situations. It takes time and investment. And so therefore, uh, you know, the original creator would be uh, decentivized uh, to go and create new ones or create other, you know, to create that one in particular. So it's going to kill the creation process if people can go and just take it and copy it willy-nilly. So copyright not only is good for the original creator, but it's also good for us as a whole because then those creative processes can continue. But there are limits to copyright, and that's the big thing when it comes in here. When we say, well, this is breaks copyright, that's not technically correct. Uh, it, you know, it, there are limits to copyright, and I'm, we're not going to go through all of them. Um, we have a great module that goes through copyright in a lot more detail. It talks about limitations uh, such as uh, first sale and classroom use, which talk about, you know, like the, the check out of books from the library or reading aloud a book to your class, those type of things. But we're going to focus specifically on the digital age and the, the copyright limits that go there. So if you have a, a clip like a movie, like Apollo 13, and you want to show it in your digital space, can you do so? And under what conditions? Okay, so um, the first thing to consider is, is it really a copy? If you link out to something else on the web, that's not technically a copy. You have the freedom through the internet to go and link to anything that's on it. Now, caution. So you go out to YouTube and you see a nice copy of Apollo 13 there and you link to it. All right, is that legal? Well, technically, that's legal. Is it ethical? 
if you know that that is a, um, a bootleg copy and you link out to it, no, that's not ethical because you know that someone is violating copyright and you're basically promoting that. Can the original creators go and have you break the link to that? Well, they, they really can't, but they can go to the person who bootlegged that copy and tell them to take it down. And that's ultimately what typically happens. If you've got a video that has utilized uh, even like background music to some extent, those uh, original creators will often make a copyright violation claim to YouTube and one day the video is there and the next day it's taken down. And so that's something to, to be aware of is even if you can legally go out and link to something, that link might not stay uh, active forever, okay? So consider that. You can link out to things, and links are legal. You have passed on the legal liability to that person who ultimately created it. But if you know that that original creation is, in essence, illegal, it's not ethical to go and support that with a link. And we'll talk more about ways you can do that ethically here in a little bit. So the second way to go and uh, limit copyright, the first one really wasn't a limit of copyright because it wasn't a copyright violation. You're not copying anything when you're linking out to it. Um, the second one, similar to that, is embedding. Okay, And embedding is a process that is, um, it's, the same rules are going to apply to linking, even though you might not think so. Embedding is going and taking something, say on YouTube, taking the code for it, placing the code in here. So what you're looking at is technically not a, a, not a copy. It's actually an original that just shows up here. It's like uh, if I was live streaming uh, someone flipping through a book at the library. Okay, well, uh, you know, I'm not technically making a copy. Now, if I went on this embed and I recorded it, now I'm making a copy because now a separate one exists. The reality is if something happened to this original, my embed would not work. So that's how you know it's not a copy. Same rules apply though. Is it uh, if you know it's bootlegged over here, it is uh, ethical because YouTube has allowed, uh, YouTube gets to decide if they if uh, their content can be embedded or not, and the creators on there can decide whether that makes embed. So you're not violating the person who put the videos up on YouTube's uh, rights because if they made that embed code available, then they are giving you permission to go and embed it. So you can do that, uh, but if that original copy is a not legal or permissible, they need to take it down, and you're embedding it is, just like linking to it, would be not necessarily ethical. And there are some cases where you don't know, so I don't, I don't want to imply that. But uh, in general, with uh, Hollywood movies and things like that, uh, there's probably a good chance that that's not ethical use unless they uh, demonstrate it. And that gets us to our third one. It's our first real limit to copyright, and that is permission. You, it's never a copyright break if the original artist gives their permission for you to make a copy of it. And that makes sense, right? You know, and we do this all the time. We will, uh, you know, uh, locally within teachers, you know, oh, hey, do you mind if I use that in your class? Sure, go ahead, whatever. That's permission. It can be spoken to you. Uh, in most cases, in a, in a digital environment, you don't really have the luxury of speaking to people necessarily, again, unless it's your fellow teachers. Uh, so you often will do a, a, a question where you go and you email somebody and then they'll email back saying, yep, that's fine. And then you could keep that email record as proof of that. Now, you can't go and do implied consent. You couldn't email somebody and say, hey, I'm going to use this. Tell me if it's a, if it's wrong. And, you know, they don't hear back from you. Ah, that's, it's okay. No, that, that doesn't work for copyright because there's no guarantee that they get the original email or they have time to actually go and act on it. They might have to confer with their lawyer and such like that. So you would need explicit consent in order to go and uh, do something like that. Or you might use a shorthand version of explicit consent. And the most common and famous one of this is called Creative Commons. Creative Commons is a really great advent here in... Um, uh, copyright and the sharing of information, rather than me wanting to use something, having to go out to that person and say, can I, can I, can I borrow this? Can I use part piece of it? They proactively said, sure. Yeah. Anybody who wants to use some of this, you can do this. There are conditions, you know, you have to cite the original uh, author who that is. Uh, in some cases you can't use that commercially. In some cases you can't go and change it. Um, but in other cases, you could use it commercially. You could go and change it. So understanding Creative Commons is good. If you see a Creative Commons logo and say, oh, wait a minute, that means I can go and use it without really having to go and do a lot of work on this. Just kind of understand the parameters for it. And in most cases, educators are pretty much fine. They're not really doing so in a commercial business, and they're not really doing so in a way that's going to break the parameters that are put on that Creative Commons. So that's that's a, a, a way that goes um, to improving the permission break, but you can still get original permission from the author. And there are also kind of large scale permissions too. So in some cases, districts have reached out to uh, publishing houses and said, hey, we'd love to have our teachers go and read aloud your book 
via video to students. Now, normally that would be a copy because you're videotaping it. It's not protected like classroom use would be where they just speak it aloud directly to their students. But in this case, and you know, the understanding of, well, COVID-19, we're all in this together um, and, and such, a lot of publishing houses said, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. You can do so under a limited basis. Uh, you can do so with maybe these books here, whatever the case is. And then that, kid, that, that permission that they've kind of given large scale then can trickle down to the individual teacher so they don't have to run around and go and do that. So that's, that's another way where you can go and uh, give permission more efficiently. So. All right, the next item uh, for a break in uh, or for uh, um, a limit to copyright is what's known as the Teach Act. And the Teach Act is something that probably are not, people are not familiar with as much as, as other things. The Teach Act is new, uh, newer, uh, it's about a decade old now. And it's very specific to online environments in essentially like a learning management system. Uh, back 10 years before that, there was a, a piece of uh, copyright expansion that came out called the DMCA, which is uh, a, a, sp a specific law that really came out with the DVDs mainly. Um, and there was a big use of going and riffing DVDs, taking the movie off of them and then, you know, having it in digital form, obviously, and then being able to share it. Uh, it just got even worse when Napster came around and then, you know, and, and things like iTunes and other things like that. People were taking uh, things. It made it really easy to go and make copies at that point in time where beforehand uh, it was a lot harder. You had to have some sort of real to real machine or something like that. So the, the process of making copies uh, what, because it was so easy, meant that we needed to go and kind of really reinforce that. So a lot of uh, uh, individuals, when um, uh, creating, you know, companies created DVDs, they put protection on there you, to make it so you couldn't rip those DVDs. Um, and, you know, you saw that quite a bit if you tried, you know, as I said, this, this action cannot be performed. Uh, same thing with, you know, with stream music on iTunes and such. So you couldn't necessarily go and make a copy of it. Now, any any uh, item that you do to go and prevent that, and there's always going to be a technological way to circumvent that thing. And, and we've just gotten to a point where it's, you know, we're just kind of, you know, trying to outsmart each other and such. The, the law, the DMC law said, well, any effort you do to go and circumvent this, if someone said, nope, you can't copy this DVD, I put protection on here, and you find out a way to go and circumvent that, that's illegal. You can't do that. And that's a, you know, it's a legal way to go and make that copy, even if the way you're using it would be, have been legal. Um, and so that became a, a big item and that really restricted a lot of use for the classroom because a lot of teachers look at that and say, well, we just certainly can't use digital, uh, digital media and copy it into the online environment. Well, it was kind of happening anyway. I mean, YouTube came around in the mid 2000s and you saw it, you know, just spur with all these different copies of things and teachers wanted to use this to go and enhance their class. And a lot of lawyers saw the, the educational benefit of having this for the first time. So something needed to be done. And so that was what the Teach Act said. They said that, that entities could go in, uh, educational entities could go in and make digital copies of things under certain parameters, okay? We can't go and just put this out to the wide web. That is a copy that that limits the uh, host's ability to go and do these things. But let's say I'm a face-to-face -face school and I buy a textbook, you know, I buy a classroom set of textbooks and uh, you know, we read those in class. And then some sort of like pandemic happens or whatever. And now students don't have those textbooks. Whatever will we do? Well, could we just go and digitize those textbooks and have them uh, at, uh, at home? Well, I mean, the law says, no, you can't do that. But logic would say, well, we already have copies of everything. We bought the copies of everything. Why can't we give them access to those copies in a digital form? Why do we have to go and buy the copies again? Um, and, you know, a lot of the textbook providers realized this. And so they basically were saying, well, if you buy these copies, we'll throw in the digital copy for free. I mean, that's kind of a, an, an add on here. But the Teach Act said, no, you can do that. That is that is permissible, but we got to make sure that this uh, that this uh, copying, this digitizing and making copies is not doing so to try to get free stuff out there. So access has to, you know, so there's a lot of parameters on the Teach Act and, and access has to be limited in those. So um, one thing first off is it has to apply directly to the curriculum. And that's where this Apollo 13 idea is kind of a bit iffy. And we said that. So, you know, having a Hollywood movie it might be educational and it might teach a lesson uh, that's, you know, related to that. But you just can't go and take uh, items that are out in Hollywood or whatever the case is and just say, oh, well, this is, you know, something that applies to my, uh, uh, to uh, this educational applies to my curriculum. I'm just going to go ahead and use it. Textbooks, on the other hand, are something that would be more applicable uh, to your curriculum. So that's, that's you know, one thing to consider. Um, another thing to consider is it has to be 
protected. You can't put this out onto the wide web. So a learning management system is a great way to do that. Now, fast forward 10 years, and that's pretty much common, you know, standard practice. We're not going to put these, you know, on places that are, you know, kind of open. Careful, Google site, that's open. So don't be doing that type of work on a Google site. Make sure it's in Google Classroom or Canvas or Moodle or, you know, Schoology or whatever the case is. If you put it on a Google site, it technically anybody in the world could find that and access it and get free access to uh, that material that uh, that they shouldn't have access to. So so that's a consideration as well. Make sure it's on learning management system three. You need to make sure that that access in there is time limited. Uh, this is not to say, well, I'm going to put it on there and it's going to be available to the end of the universe. No, if it's part of a class, the access for those students should end when that class ends. It should be taken down. Now, in COVID-19, that kind of makes sense. Okay, we're doing this to you know during this time when we wouldn't have normal access for it. So after we put it in there, uh, when we're done with the year, all of those uh, copied materials should be taken off the site. And you know, if you need to go and uh, have the second wave of this come, say, you know, in the fall or whatever, if we're back into a quarantine situation, no, no problem. Just put the video back on there. Just make sure it's limited because if you don't, that enhances the possibility that that video is going to be accessed by somebody else. So, uh, and then there's a couple other things with it. Um, first off, that copy needs to be a legally owned copy. So again, you can't have just gone and stolen or you know copied some other one off the web and then use it in your um, uh, in your class. Uh, and that's you know that's something to consider. There is that you know have you as a t teacher bought that copy or does your school have that copy and such? Uh, and so if not, just like that textbook example, uh, if you just you know got the loaner uh, copy of that textbook, you say, oh great, I'm gonna go digitize that. That doesn't make it permissible. You have to have the original copies of that textbook. You also need to have uh, a credit for the original author. You can't pr you can't uh, suggest that this is your own. Uh, copy, which, you know, with Apollo 13, I don't think any student's going to think, oh, yeah, you know, Mr. Burns, uh, my uh, science teacher created this. No. What you're going to have is you're going to you're going to need to state, yeah, this is, you know, from whatever Paramount Pictures, uh, that, that, that case, don't quote me on that. I don't know if it's from Paramount Pictures. Um, uh, but then you also need to have a warning on there because this use cannot then go be retransmitted. It is legally being given to students under the Teach Act, but then the students cannot go and make their own copy with it or give unauthorized access uh, to this, and you need to state that in there. Now, could a student go give their login credentials to their next door neighbor so they could get in and watch the clips of Apollo 13, which they probably have seen already? Uh, yeah, they could, and there's really nothing a district could go and do and stop that, but that's illegal on the student's basis. If you've given a warning on that, then that's what you need to do in order to be quote-unquote in the clear using Teach Act. And finally, with that, you also need to do what you can to prevent students from making a copy. So do what you can to warn them to not give unauthorized access and to make a copy. Now this is where it gets a little challenging because as I mentioned, the tools are pro uh, proliferant out there that if I, if I want to make a copy of a movie online, I can do it. I mean, there's a, you know, and there are tools built into browsers that do this now. So it's really tough for you to go as a teacher and do that. I could make a screencast of it. I could, you know, I could get my phone out and record it. I mean, it's just, there's no way to really stop that. So really the best thing that teachers can do is to go and put again a, a claim that says that, you know, you cannot go and make a copy of this. So that's the TEACH Act. And that allows you to go and take a lot of in-class materials and digitize them. But I don't think that's going to actually allow you to take a Apollo 13 clip and then go and show that. And that's where we get to our final one. And this is the one that you probably have heard of and um, uh, might not know quite how it applies. And that's called fair use. Fair use is to say that, you know, there are things, there's content that has fair purposes that allow us to limit copyright. And those purposes aren't just education. Uh, they're also things like parody. You know, I, I have, we, as, as our society, we give value to the right for us to go and lampoon what someone else has done um, and such and, and not say, oh, you can't go and make fun of, say, the president or Congress or whomever because of copyright violation. No, you're allowed to do those sort of things. So <clears throat> fair use allows you to do that. For educators, <clears throat> it allows us to go and utilize uh, pieces of media, not the whole media necessarily, in some cases, maybe maybe so, like a cartoon or something. It's kind of hard to say when I just want a little bit of it. But in typical pieces of media, you can copy it without it really kind of being considered a copy, or it's a fair use of that copy. Now, fair use 
is only permissible because it went to court and people argued that, yeah, you know, educators should be able to do this. And because of that, fair use is still often up to judicial interpretation of what is fair use. And in all honesty, one judge could say, yeah, that is fair use. And another judge could say, no, it's not. So it's really hard to give us cut and dry parameters for it. There have emerged four criteria for what is fair use. And those are pretty famous. And <clears throat> while they kind of can be intimidating at first, I think teachers can do a good job of navigating these. So the first factor is, what's that character of use? And I kind of alluded that to already. Education is a permissible uh, use of content to go. There's a benefit to society to use content to go and educate other people um, and such. Um, it's not, you know, in of itself sufficient. Just because you're an educator doesn't mean you can go and do anything you want. But it helps and it's harder for people if I just want to go and show clips just to make my channel cool or whatever the case is, that does not necessarily allow me uh, to do that. But it doesn't, you know, that's just one factor. You'll find that if you listen to like podcasts, you'll find little clips of music in there that are probably not, you know, there's probably not direct permission from the original artist um, to, to use those and such like that. But, um, you know, while they're not as high on the first factor, the other three might be so. So what's the second factor? Well, the second factor is kind of the nature of that original work. Uh, and this is, <clears throat> this might be a little counterintuitive. The nature of the work means, that, you know, was it published or not, as well as how creative of a piece is it uh, as well. Now, if it's published, that actually makes it easier to go and then use. If you have someone who has created something that's not published, if it's in draft form, it's their own personal thoughts and you use it, it's a big no-no. Uh, that's going to be a copyright violation unless you got permission from them um, because unpublished work is I'm not putting it out there at all. I want this to remain private. And that's, uh, and that's so going and making it public and using it even for education, even for good purposes, will get you in trouble. So uh, the fact that it is published, most teachers are not looking to publish on a published work. Uh, the fact that it's published helps. Um, but in the case of Apollo 13, Apollo 13 is more of a creative exercise than it is a factual one. There could be factual documentaries on the Apollo 13 moon mission. Those would be better to show probably than the movie on this factor, okay? Because you can't copyright facts. Facts are, they're not owned by anybody. Now, someone presenting facts starts to get there because, you know, there, there's a little bit of creativeness on that. When Walter Cronkite did news broadcasts, the news were facts. His broadcast of the news was a creative aspect for it. Uh, but in many cases, educators can go and take that because the main part of that is the factual nature that they're doing. Now, Apollo 13 has some factual nature over, you know, some movies that are just totally creative processes. It would be very, very hard to justify using clips of Star Wars in a history class, for example. I'll let you think about that one. Uh, so that nature of the work does vary even between, you know, movie to movie in that case. All right. So then the next one, and this is one that a lot of educators think about, is the amount that you use. And you've seen guidelines for it, and I'm going to tell you, the guidelines are just guidelines. They are not going to protect you, and they're not going to necessarily be the limit for you. You'll say, oh, I can only use 30 seconds of this, or I can use this or this. The guidelines are just educators, kind of like me and you, who said, well, how much do you think it is? That would be permissible. Well, maybe about this much. There are times where uh, you know things have gone to court, such as Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven song, where you have three notes. And on the fourth, that's a copyright violation because of the nature of that song. And one simple is one. Uh, but there are others where, you know, um, um, the judge has said, uh, you know, you use the entire text. I think that's fine and made the whole thing permissible. So it can really vary. The, the amount of it um, is not cut and dry. Still, the less amount you use, the better off it is. So instead of putting on the entire Apollo 13 movie, take clips of it, shorter, shorter clips of it that don't go to the whole movie. And that's really that part B of this third item is that there's a difference between parts. Not all parts are equal. If you put the credits on there, I don't think they're going to care. <laughs> I don't think your class is going to care either, but I don't think they're going to care because the credits are really not why the thing is copyrighted to begin with. They're not really the, the, the big item that's worth seeing. Uh, obviously, the big item that we're seeing is the storyline within Apollo 13. Now, what this engineer probably wanted, I don't know for sure, but it's probably specific scenes where engineers are doing great engineering things. I had used in my own teaching the clip of the uh, uh, the, the engineers who had to go and fit the, the square filter into the round hole, right? Uh, and, and, you know, had to create this crazy contraption to do it in order so that the people up in the module could breathe because their filters were failing. And it's a great example of that that you know we showed here in this video. The thing is, is that that clip, while being a good part of Apollo 13 and certainly an educational part, isn't really like the heart of the movie. The movie obviously is much larger than that. And even certain scenes of that movie would, would capture 
the heart of the movie as well. And so this really becomes a big thing. Educators can go and use little elements to illustrate certain concepts and be, have that be permissible because they're not showing the entire movie. I'm not giving you the entire story of Apollo 13. I'm showing you this little bit over here. So that's, um, in this case, and that's where I would start to say, well, Apollo 13, if you show little clips of this, this is where it becomes useful is because you're keeping it limited and you're not focusing on the heart of the story. The fourth one, and this also helps this particular teacher, is the effect on the marketplace. If you were to go and copyright something, does that eliminate or preclude that person's ability to get sales uh, for it? Well, Apollo 13 has been out 25 years now, uh, so um, and it's still a great movie. But it's not making uh, as much in digital sales or in, in, in physical sales as it did when it first came out. So going and making copies of older movies allow, uh, would be more permissible under fair use than making something that's out right away. Some educators will see movies that came out right away when Hidden Figures came out. They wanted to use that right away. Well, a lot of times, you know, judges are saying, you need to be patient. You come back in two years, sure, that use would be permissible. But this movie's still in the box office right now. Or, you know, it's just come out. And uh, if you're going and making clips for it, you know, that might not be uh, as beneficial. Now, that, you know, a lot of movie uh, uh, companies will say, well, wait a second. If you show little clips of it, that might get more people to go and watch that movie. And so they oftentimes will promote or will work with people to go and to, to use those clips. And that's what my ultimate uh, recommendation for uh, this teacher would be. So my recommendation in this situation is I do think Apollo 13 is okay to use in your course in a fair use setting under certain conditions. A, is the original copy you have legal um, and such. And uh, even if you're making a link out to it or an embed, which um, just probably likely rather than going and ripping your own original copy and uploading it. Uh, that might be legal to make that link, but now it gets in that ethical question. I think it's, it is ethical, certainly if you own your own copy, whether it's you personally or your district. Um, you're using something that is older, uh, that has been around a while, and so the market value is not, you know, you're not taking away business from it. Uh, but most importantly, you need to use small select clips that are not basically the essence of the story and use them for educational purposes. Uh, if you're using a clip on that engineering, but you're doing so in your instrumental music class, it'd be a little harder for me to justify why that's educational to the curriculum. Uh, and even more so, you need to make sure that you grant, you know, um, uh, credit to that original provider. One of the things I recommend to teachers to do this that kind of helps take care of all that stuff is to use existing sites that have already gone through that process. And one that I like a lot is wingclips.com. It's been around a long time. And there are others. Wingclips was actually created to help pastors go find clips that they could use in sermons. And sermons, while well, you might think it's a religious purpose, is granted as an educational purpose under copyright law and fair use. So uh, pastors obviously wanted to go and take inspirational parts or parts that have a good message around, you know, human behavior or, you know, just, just, just traits around faith or whatever the case is. And um, they wanted to show those to uh, their, uh, you know, their congregation. Well, that's obviously going to be a copyright break. So they want to do it in a legal way. So Wingclips has gone and negotiated with those uh, production companies en masse and done so under parameters. Basically, they say that, yes, if you can use this video, the users of these video will credit the original creators of it. They're going to limit the amount to the clips that we put on. And it's going to then be a, a way to promote the video to those larger audiences. So it does make sense to that original company. It makes sense to the uh, to the individual who's uh, using that. And also, you know, Wingclips has helped kind of facilitating that type of connection. And, and in this case, yeah, that would make sense. There are many great videos, as you can see here, on wing clips that have already taken them from Apollo 13. You could utilize those and put them into your uh, into your course. So that's uh, one of my suggestions. I, I mentioned this, you know, wing clips is great to kind of go and navigate that um, copyright question on your own. It doesn't mean that you can't do it through YouTube, but there's a lot of parameters you have to think about in order to make a determination. And ultimately, the determination you can make is, you know, how well do I feel about this? Would this hold up in court? I can sound intimidating. You say, well, I don't want to go to court. <laughs> you know, I want to kind of avoid that. Uh, one of the, the, the realities is if there is a copyright violation, by and large, copyright violations result in a cease and desist letter. If you use a public platform like YouTube to go and do that copyright, copyright violation, uh, often though they could um, disable that account that you've done uh, there as a measure. But there isn't always financial 
uh, uh, penalties with that. Under law, there can be financial penalties, but if that's the attorney saying, well, I want to do this, I want to use this media to go and, and uh, to educate, and I'm really worried about this because I don't know how to navigate it, kind of keep that in mind is that uh, a lot of times the uh, teachers, it's kind of well known, the teachers don't know what they can use. Now, if they use the whole movie, that's not, uh, you know, naivete is not going to help you out with that. You can't just go and rebroadcast the whole movie. But if you've gone to the effort and said, yeah, I just want to use clips here, and a publishing company still says, no, no, that's a copyright violation, typically the, the, the understanding is, well, the teacher just did not know that that was the heart of the work or this type of thing. They should be given a cease and desist and take that down. Obviously, they, they uh, ignore the cease and desist. Well, then, you know, financial penalties could come about. So keep that in mind. If you're making a good faith effort to stay within copyright and you've made some things like crediting the source and using limited things and thought about these particular parameters, then you're going to be okay. You're going to be at least in a position where you should say, okay, I did what I thought I could, obviously still in violation, so I'm going to go in and take it uh, and take it down. And that's going to, um, uh, that's going to benefit you. Uh, a, a legal interpretation is that they'd say, you know, uh, ignorance of the law is never uh, uh, permissible or whatever the case is. But if you're uh, understanding of at least those factors and given the nebulous nature of copyright law when it comes to fair use, you're saying, hey, I understand to some extent that fair use is applicable. I tried to follow these guidelines. If I didn't follow them correctly, okay, well, then I need help with that. And that's going to, that's going to protect you in that case. So, that's kind of a quick crash course on copyright law. If you have any questions about that, please feel free to uh, contact me. Otherwise, I uh, hope you guys are uh, engaging in good remote learning.